This morning, I'm chatting with M. Palmore, a teacher in Melbourne, Australia, about sewing with her students. Thanks, M, for chatting me, with me today. M? It's, it's a pleasure, Trixie. It's lovely. <laughs> it's always a bit weird over Zoom, although we're all kind of used to it. Um, oh, I know. I don't think I'm ever going to get used to Zoom. But uh, M, do you want to introduce yourself to sure. everyone? I'm I'm M. Palmore. I've been teaching on and off for 27 years and uh, I've been teaching almost the last decade in primary school and I've been at Footscray City Primary School in Melbourne in the inner west, a very vibrant multicultural area and I am the specialist art teacher so I teach the kids every year from when they come to school for the seven years they're at primary school and I watch them go off to high school um, so I teach up to 500 kids a week. So it's a, it's a big job. And my class sizes range from uh, sort of the junior levels around averaging around 20 kids up to the senior classes, when I say senior, grade five and six. And they um, can go up usually around 25, but sometimes up to 28 kids. So, And Em, you've been sewing with your students? I have. So I graduated in uni in 96 in textiles was my major. And I went and um, as well as being a textile artist, I moved into secondary teaching. So I used to teach garment construction oh, wow. um, and fabric printing in different units. Um, but I've, I've brought the wealth of my skills into the primary school art room as well. And at the end of last year, I did a whole term unit just on sewing and weaving. Wow. Whole and term I did that amazing. from the junior grades right through to the senior grades. So the, the whole term was just sewing and weaving? It in, was. So the, all your classes. The, the whole integrated curriculum that the classroom teachers were looking at for that term was design and technology and sustainability. Oh, wow. So I was sort of looking at opening the kids' eyes to where textiles come from, how they're used in our lives, and the sustainability of learning those life skills of mending, repairing, yeah. looking at environmental impact, economic impact. So, you know, and they really got into that. I think they really understood, you know, quite quickly. Um, and we looked at some videos of artists who did visible mending. Like oh, I love visible mending. And oh, the kids really enjoyed that. So it was great. What sewing projects were you doing with your classes? Okay, so the little ones, I was really starting off with some basic sewing through fabrics, stitching um, and sewing things onto fabrics and really just getting that sort of technique going. And then I moved it up. So we, we went from very school-based in the junior le levels to by the time we got to the fives and sixes, particularly the sixes who are about to go to high school at the end of that year, I was really looking at gratitude with them. So we did a project and your, your website was very inspiring for them. Thanks. Um, so we actually, I actually asked them to sew a softy um, and then gift it to their junior buddy. So they all had a buddy in, in the first year of school. And so looking at that legacy of how they could think about that buddy they've had all year and what they would like and actually make something for them. Because I think it's a very self-absorbed time of year for, oh. for grade six and they've already, a lot of them have left the building yeah. um, and thinking about high school. So it was a really nice way of bringing them back to that project. Um, and the other project that I got them to look at was the Thousand Hearts. Yeah. You know, if you're familiar, you're nodding at me, you're familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. um, and also so I was them. getting them for fundraising if they finished their softy to make some of those hearts and think about who they could gift them to. We sold some at some fundraising stalls at the school. So it was all about thinking about it. while a lot of this stuff going on for them with graduation ceremonies and all of that, but actually focusing on their gratitude through the projects as well. Yeah, I think that's actually really important for kids to see that 
they can actually do something for another person. They can make another person happy. It's not just, you know, like you said, it's all about them, that they see that, you know, they also, it's important to be part of a community and to do things for people in the community, which is yeah. whether they're little buddies or helping someone they don't even know who they are. I think it's and, really um, It's in my name, Empower More, Empower More Art, but I'm all about yes. empowering kids to use their skills and then they feel empowered that they've got these skills that they can make something for someone else. Absolutely. You know, and they can, you know, put a smile on someone's face or yeah. create that connection. And I think that's really like, that's something I really love. I think it's really important to show kids that they can make a difference to somebody's life. I think often kids are just given lots of things and it's about them and, you know, no, you can make a difference. You can, like you say, empower kids to, once they realise they can help another person, it's like you say, they empower themselves. It makes them feel more self-confident about themselves and what their abilities is. So I just love that whole idea of showing kids that they can make a difference. And that and I, they're part of the community. Yeah, that's right. And it also, I mean, there's lots of evidence that um, being grateful and generous makes you happier too. Yeah. And so yes. from a well-being point of view, I think helping them through a very emotional time in their school lives where they're transitioning to high school, um, my whole emphasis in terms of the well-being aspect of what we were doing was actually helping them focus on something other than themselves would actually ground them and make them happier. Yeah, absolutely. I just love that. The idea that, you know, helping other people, you know, makes you happier than I guess doing things for yourself all the time. That's amazing. Oh, I'm all about positivity. Oh, and oh, making, I love it. That's you know, true. to enrich our lives. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's sort of, it, it encompasses kids, all their, you know, person that they everything about them, like, you know, their confidence, their self-esteem, Anyway, back to those sewing projects. So how did you um, prep your kids um, to start sewing in ter terms yeah, of... Yeah, so um, I was really looking at improved methods because teaching up to 28 kids where I think teaching sewing is very much a one-on-one -on -one type yes. thing, particularly when you're getting yes. into a lot of knots and tangles. And it is a very small thing to be doing, very fine motor. So unless you've had a grandparent or a parent or someone else in your life who sat next to you and helped you it's quite demanding on one teacher teaching that oh. many kids at once so I was really looking at things and analyzing my previous projects and looking at all the things that went wrong um, and so a few things a few tips that I can really give was um, I made little videos some of them were only a minute long on my YouTube channel and the kids were very familiar with my YouTube channel because I've been teaching a lot through the lockdowns in Melbourne with my YouTube channel videos. And I used that video and the knot tying videos. It was great because I could show my hands really close up, but up on the big classroom TV. And if a kid was away, I could hand them an iPad and they could practice it again oh, themselves. Um, and or if a kid was particularly struggling, I could then utilize the technology to help them. So it freed me up helping other kids as well. So that was a really good tip. And we used to watch the video as a warm up at the beginning of each class, just to remind them, because I, I teach them once a week. A week can be a long time in a five year old's life. Oh, absolutely. Between, how long are you your know, when you're learning a skill? So mm -hmm. how long are your classes? How long do you have? So they're only 50 minutes. 50 so it's not a lot of time. Once a um, week. So I have a whole lot of Google slides that I use. So I put up the learning intentions and success criteria for each lesson. There's usually the videos, um, some inspiration images, like some of the ones from your website, some links. And um, the other thing I had to do was like a bit of pre-cutting of fabrics. Yeah. Um, now I'm dealing in bigger sizes. I probably would order the felt and the um, hessian and stuff pre-cut. Um, but I had a whole lot of stuff that I was trying to use up. It was the end of year. So I did spend quite a lot of time cutting, yes. cutting and preparing materials. Um, and the other thing I was doing was stop taking what I already had. So I had embroidery needles. And with the junior kids, I used blunter ones that had a bigger eye. So they were really easy to thread. And then with the older kids, I had um, the sharper needles that would go through the thread. They were still embroidery needles, but they had more of a point on them. But they were still pretty easy to thread. 
Um, what thread did you use with your kids? Okay, so the juniors, I used more wools. Yeah. And with the older ones, I used more embroidery threads. Um, the other thing I did was I cut up all this hessian, and I absolutely hate <laughs> hessian because I get um, really itchy from it, yeah. like a bit of a reaction to it. But I thought, no, I'm going to use this up. But the other thing I found too with the, so, um, sorry, I'm rambling my thoughts a bit here. But I, I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, um, I wanted them to learn to sew a button on, but then I realised that the bigger eyed needles wouldn't go through a conventional the whole of the needle. So I had this, I went searching for beads and I found these amazing flower discs um, that were designed for construction and putting oh, yeah. together. They were just little plastic discs, but they had a nice big hole in the middle. So I actually used them and we sewed them into their projects a bit too. Um, so that was my way around getting, getting around, getting the skill of sewing on a button, but without actually using a button. So I was, I was hunting around with, you know, a bit of a bower bird, you know, collecting things from different things and looking at what materials might work for the purpose. So, so you used Hessian with up to what age, the foundation? So I was using that with, the, I call the juniors, the foundation grade one and grade two students. So I was using that and I actually hot glued it to a cardboard frames that I had okay. um, that I just wanted to use up. So they were quite fit. I found doing a project in the past, if I just give them a piece of Hessian, sometimes they get it all wrapped up and tangled together. So I found having it in a frame. Now, if budget was no issue, I would have bought embroidery hoops. Oh, yes. And I would have um, maybe got not Hessian, but like an embroidery fabric to, to put over that. But that's something for the future. Um, one thing I did find really cool was getting a plastic mesh um, that you can buy in A4 sheets. And I cut that up into smaller pieces. And I also used thick cardboard paper plates to sew in. And that was really good for the juniors because they could poke the holes with their needle beforehand and then sew through. Yeah, so. And we looked at doing, um, I've got a little video on my YouTube and my TikTok and stuff of uh, me sewing some emoji faces with the softies. Oh, wow. And a lot of the kids really engaged with that, the ones who don't normally sew. Um, I was trying to make it sort of funky and relevant to them. Um, but we did that with the paper plates because they're that round face. So we used yellow thread and, and then we did the different expressions on the face in the middle of these thick paper plates. And that was a great beginner project. I'd definitely do that again. Kids would have loved it. What projects were you doing? So once you used felt with the years of three to three to six, so five and six were doing softies, uh, to give to the their buddies. Yeah, the fives and sixes were doing softies. The threes and fours, we focused more on um, little pixel art pictures. So I gave them plastic mesh. And the thing that was exciting about that was they related really well to pixel art because they're all used yeah. to playing Minecraft and different games. And they could really see that each square was like a different pixel. So their visual reference was so different to what mine was growing up. Yeah. But they really thought, it, yeah, they really engaged with it and they were building little characters and, you know, they really loved it. So that was an unexpected um, an unexpected benefit. So the threes and fours did that because they're sort of more getting into computer games and stuff at that age. The, and the juniors did the um, the Hessian sort of just basic sewing, sewing a button on, just kind of like exploring threads in fabric, different colours, um, different stitches. And the grade twos did the paper plate fa emoji faces. Yeah. Okay. With the five and sixes, when you're teaching them, was there any sort of supplies that you use that you thought like these supplies I'll, I'll either never use again because they didn't work or supplies that you said thought were like really amazing um yes I think I'd get a lot more yellow black red and blue for the emoji <laughs> faces because I was just using so a lot of the colors ran out quite quickly and I had to yeah, get that, them to sort of just 
make do with what we had. Where did so you buy your felt? Them. Sorry, where did you buy your felt? Yeah, so um, I use an art supplier called Zart Art, Zart. but I've also yep. discovered that Dean's Art in um, sells felt on a roll, so you can get bigger pieces and you can just get more of one colour that you want. A lot of the felts you buy from art supplies are in mixed colour packets, and so if you yep. just want the yellow, you end up with a whole lot of other colours that you don't want. So It's more economically when you're cutting it out. If you've got A4 size felt you often just can't like the cutting out you get more out of the the rolls of felt when it's large you can get more um more yeah fun. yeah so it depends on the project and what we're doing um a lot of what we were doing was using up um what we had so yes. I would give them a, a square couple of square pieces for their base and then all the bits they wanted to add were just from our tubs of leftover colors and they just rumble through and find what they needed for the fives and sixes did, were they doing their softies off a design that the, their little buddies had given them or did the five and sixes just design their own softies to give yeah look i i have seen those projects and that's um been very successful where the prep but this time we started off with, I, I like to give the kids some examples and then just let them go for it. Yes. So they're really having that design and creative yeah. input and, and choice in it too. They're much more engaged if they're making something they want to make. Yeah. So I found some of them made the emoji pillows and then others started to branch out. And what I loved was there was some, you know, big sporty boys who don't normally you know connect as well with their art but then they decided that they were going to sew a letter which is the first letter of their buddy's name wow and you know so they went that just or they were you know um doing another little character that they knew they they were into so I let them explore that really nice. I just gave them the parameters of these are the materials this is some ideas to get you started if you're not sure what to make make the emoji pillow or a heart but you can really make whatever you want what sort of problems did you find with the five and sixes when they were sewing was anything um, difficulties that came up either for them or were you teaching all those kids at once yeah one thing that I've learned is and I always make them um laugh a bit I like to be a bit cheeky in my teaching style too and so a lot of kids do this loser thing with their hand and oh, go, yes. it's actually the length of thread you need to leave <laughs> at the end of your oh, sewing oh I love a knot <laughs> yes oh that is so and good because they always sew right up to the end right and then they go the oh end. I can't tie a knot can you do it and I'm like well you know I'm pretty good at knot tying but I can't tie a knot in thread that's yes. all so I always remind them about the leave a bit of thread. Yes, that's um, really good. Um, and they can measure that and test it as they're sewing. So that's a good tip. Um, the other thing that was quite fun that I did with all the kids, of the, I don't know, did you pay elastics in the 80s? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Obsessive, right? I've tried to start it as a trend in the, in the contemporary playground a few times. It's sort of taken off for a little bit and then died down. But uh, I um I utilized it so I actually set up the art room and I tied elastic between the table and chair legs to create like an obstacle course and I actually got the kids to come in and out of the classroom and go under over under over the elastics yeah 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 they came and sat that down for that for instruction so I felt like that whole body I used to teach dance and drama as well so that's sort oh, of kinetic goodness. learning that whole body thing yeah. of under over under over so that by the time we were doing it just little in our hands they knew what I was talking about and then sensation because I find kids unless you're teaching an over stitch or a blanket stitch and you're going round and round a lot of kids will go round and round and not realize they've gone around the frame or the embroidery yeah. group or whatever you're using and they've got themselves in a big tangle so I found that whole body even if you bob up and down on the spot and play a bit of a game before you start and sit down and do the sewing circle I start off with a sewing circle as well and I have a giant needle I cut out of cardboard and a bit of rope yeah. and I can show them I can actually lie it down in the middle of the circle and I show them how to put the ends of the thread together stretch the needle out put the loop 
and then put the ends through the loop. And because it's bright red rope, they can all see it in the middle and we can support each other. And we practice tying knots for a little bit before we actually launch into the sewing. So in the sewing circle, you had them all t- tying knots? Um, yes. Practicing so knots. we started and then I'd go around and, and I'd chop them all and make them do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was they were doing with a bit of wool or rope or? Yeah, just, just a bit thread. of wool through their needle. And um, I got them to tie a few knots in their thread before we started, just so they were feeling confident, yeah, with that. So that... And that repetition, again, a week's a long time yeah. in your life. So like, doing that again at the beginning of the next class for the next first few lessons. I like the idea of the sewing circle. That's a really lovely idea just to bring them in. They sew, they're practising together. And, and you can be tact, tactical with your seating in that sewing yeah. circle. So you can sit kids who you know have had some sewing experience at home next to kids who might need a bit more support. and um, and then you can get those groups instead of one big circle to sit around with each other yeah. and support each other as well. That's really um, lovely for the kids. How did yeah, you get them to practice the threading their needles? Did you um, use needle threaders or just get them? No, I didn't. Threading I know people have used like a folded piece of paper before. Yep. Yes, slip of paper. But I didn't find, I think because I used the embroidery needles with the bigger hoop I didn't find we needed them so um, again it was restrictive because you can't really sew on buttons with them if you're going to use a project for buttons but um, I found having that was much easier than um, all the kids really coped with that yeah with the embroidery so that's the embroidery floss with the six little strands did the kids have any problems with those six little strands getting you through or they all just managed to do it I bought, I bought thread that came on bigger sort of round rolls. With a oh, that's not roll embroidery. In the middle. Oh, that's actually a different, that's pearl thread, yeah. doesn't it? Because yeah. embroidery thread actually has got. It this. has those different strands and that's harder because you might, yes, yes. I don't know what you yes. mean. Yes, so that's crochet thread, that okay. one. Okay. So doesn't, oh, that all pearl cotton, they've got a few different names. Oh, okay. Yes, that's, that's, that's what we use. We use the pearl cotton um, and then the wool with the juniors. And did you get uh, there were to... some wools we had donated that had that twisted threading or different colours in them, and the kids were really attracted to them because they might have had a metallic through them. Yes, or something. Yeah, yeah. but they were really difficult. So a few of them I just pocketed and didn't come out <laughs> the next lesson because it was just too, too hard for the kids. Yeah, yeah, it was. So yeah, you want to make it. You want to make those decisions for them so that they're going to succeed. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's every project. It's like when I do a project with my kids, they've got to succeed. They've got to, for me, at least in my workshops, they've got to finish by the end of that lesson. That that project has to be finished. The kids don't go home with half-finished projects because mm. they never get finished at home. At home yeah, so it's finished. not, it, it's about um, helping Succeed. them some time manage and not take on a project that's too ambitious. And to be successful, like you say, that they feel good about whatever they do that it's not something that, that has to be undone. Like I remember when I was at school, you did wrong stitches that, you know, have to be undone. In the, my classes, I always, always, you know, whatever stitches they do, like every stitch is a good stitch. So yep. that if, if the stitch is too big, it doesn't matter. We just go over it with another colour to make it like not feel that you've done all this work and now it gets pulled in. It's really sort of... Um, I forget the word. I but talk to know. them about it adding, adding to its personality or texture. Yeah, we talk a lot about beautiful looks. There's no mistakes. There's a beautiful look. Right. And you might have to work out how to problem solve your yeah. way out of it. Um, but, yeah, there's, again, no mistakes. Maybe if you've gone around the embroidery, yes. Hoop, yes. maybe you need to cut it off and tie a little. Yeah, exactly. Knot, but then maybe that becomes part of That's, the texture yeah. of the piece. Yeah. I always tell the you know this idea that perfect is overrated. You know that's we don't need perfect stitches or you know everything like that. I it was, can it can be really challenging for kids on autism spectrum um, who have a very uh, clear idea of what they want and what it should look like. They can find that quite difficult. So sometimes it's assisting them. Yeah. Um, but but I know who those kids are. I can help and assist and, and target my support to that. So I know which ones to sort of push yeah. to be a bit more open and flexible 
and resilient with it and which ones will need a bit more support yeah, in that way. Yeah, because you know your students. Um, mm. When you did your threading, did you just, did you double over your thread or just have the single single layer thread? With no, you? always double it. When oh, I'm you did double it. In primary okay. school because they've got that knot in the end then. And I always do what I call an anchor stitch. You might call it something different, Trixie, but when I go through the fabric and then back, I always get them to put the needle through the middle of the threads just for, um, above oh. the knot. So when they pull it through, they're not pulling their thread through their fabric because some of them are very exuberant when they yes. hank their threads through. Yeah. So I always call it an anchor knot. Um, You're getting them to put, when they go, come up, they're putting their needle through the thread. Through the two, yeah, through the two threads, yes, so oh. that the knot grips on. Yes. And that's how we start all our stitches, yeah. Oh, I do get my kids to do a double stitch. So they'll do like a back stitch and another stitch on top uh, of it. Yeah. And I've actually realized that you don't, if you're doing a double stitch at the beginning and the end of your work, you actually don't need that knot there because all mm -hmm. you need to do is have a, a, as long as the kids know they've got to leave a tail. So yeah. leave a tail, do the double stitch, which is basically like a knot. Not so they don't need an actual knot. And when they get to the end of their running stitch, again, they do that double stitch. Yes. Take it through the end or out to the side of the fabric, cut it off. Yeah. And no knots. They don't problems. need it. No. Not free. I know. <laughs> free of the terrors of knot tying with Kids young still children. <laughs> Kids I'll still have to take knots. that tip on. I'll give it a go. <laughs> oh, have, um, I did have, have this gorgeous anecdote about, so one of our kids, because we were doing the visible mending, oh, I and um, he asked me if I'd sew up a hole in his sock. And I said, well, I've taught you to sew. You can have a go. And the next day he came into school and he had bright blue knee-high soccer socks on and he'd used yellow wool. <laughs> <laughs> but he darned it. But like, oh, my kind of like gone overboard. But it was this amazing, like, I love it. I'm a very colourful person. And I was just so happy. And he was so proud of himself. Oh, he isn't came that in amazing? And he came on and he looked at what, and I could see it from right across the yard, what he'd done <laughs> before he even got to me with the explanation. It was just beautiful. And the other thing we did, I, I did some finger knitting with those who finished early. And again, I had a little video and I taught them to finger knit. And I had these boys who, grade three and four, they're normally just like on computer screens all weekend or playing footy. And their parents were in shock. They said to me, they organised a play date to do finger knitting and they oh. finger knitted the length of the house. They did 12 metre. It became this finger knitting competition between them. That's and they incredible. sat down in their lounge room with my YouTube video going on the finger knitting just to get them going. <laughs> they knitted the whole house. I thought it was fantastic. It reminded me of uh, that artist Christo who used yes. to buildings yes. in plastic and I thought I told them I showed them the image and I said this could be your future with finger knitting you oh can wrap goodness. buildings and houses and it's, yeah, it oh, became I've, this whole thing it took off it was fantastic I've actually found sometimes that the boys are actually more enthusiastic or at least so enthusiastic about the sun you wouldn't think and they're like you said they're sporty kids I don't know what it is they start sewing and they're they light up and they actually just love it and they're all they're waiting already for the next project before they're yes. finished the first project. I think weaving is the same. It's very um it's very calming and it things happen very quickly, you know. It, it kind of they can see so it's satisfying, you know, they can see these projects coming together. And I think as long as you're not doing a you know, something that they perceive, you know, I always try and make the projects kind of cool yeah, um, and pop arty and colourful and, you know, um, I think that's, you know, great for engagement. Yeah, I think sometimes the boys don't get as many creative activities as the girls because the girls are often getting beating sets and this and that and the boys are often being given like footies, footballs and yeah, but very yeah, stuff's very gendered, and actually, it's not a not about that at all. When you actually really look at it, and you know, I've had some kids with ADHD who can't sit still, but they actually will sit there and weave for fifteen I know. minutes, I and know. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> It's really amazing. You now I've got like sometimes I have in my class like five year olds who you know people say oh they can't concentrate. Who are there from ten till three? Who are sitting down sewing the whole time at lunchtime? They go out for five or ten minutes and want to come straight back in so they can start their sewing and 
people think you know, these kids can't five-year-olds can't concentrate but if they want to do something they can concentrate and it's just yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Isn't it? it's really amazing to see um any- one thing I saw on Instagram that I want to try because another challenge is your wools and threads getting really tangled particularly yes. when lots and lots of kids are using them and one thing I try to do is separate them into smaller containers of by color because they're normally attracted to the color that they want and we always put a bit of masking tape on the end of the thread when they put it back so the next person can find it it. and it stops it unwrapping and tangling with other threads as well but I did see someone and I've tried different things I've tried the plastic shoe holder curtains with a hole through the bottom to pull the thread I've tried the boxes with the hole in it for the thread but I did see someone had done I had these big two litre clear plastic juice jugs or water jugs with a lid and they had so the kids could see the color of the thread in there but the thread was coming out the spout oh, and wow. they just cut off what they wanted so I was thinking I might give that a try <laughs> okay that sounds that sounds good you've got to update me how that works yeah you could set up like a rainbow you'd need enough for all the rainbow colors and then your neutrals and just get them to pull it out and cut off what they need um, How do you get your kids to measure how long they want their threads? Yeah, I get them to hold it against their, the thread against their chest and then just stretch their mm. arm out. This so I, I find that length is good, an arm's length. Any longer, they get tangled. Yes. Um, but particularly because we're doubling the thread, that that's length because then it's, yes. it's that length to sew with. It gives them enough stitches before they get frustrated. They have to tie it Stop off and, and get more. Again. Yeah. Uh, any interesting, funny experiences that you've ever had in the classroom? Um, well, yes. I, I mean, teaching a long time, there's a lot. But, you know, that that soccer darning sock. Was that was a, that was a classic. Just the engagement of the kids, you know, that 12-metre yarn bombing oh, and then finding that they're amazing. coming to get wool from me to go and sit at lunchtime. Oh and wanting to finger knit together and just seeing oh. that happening. And then I was sort of wrapping it around trees with them. Oh, and Creating, yes. you know, and so I'd go out and then I'd find there's a pom-pom hanging from a branch oh, or I there's more things wrapped around the tree than what we put there. And the kids were sort of adding and it took on this life. Oh. Um, the other thing that yes, I, I do that. with them is weave in and out of the cyclone wire fencing. Oh, uh, yes. School. So little things they've made and there'd be this little installation that just sort of got added oh. to a little bit just from, yeah. I mean, there's stuff that I do with them, but then just seeing them take it on themselves. That's and it amazing. Has their own life. Oh, yeah. the students are really lucky to have you as their teacher. Your classes sound <laughs> yeah. amazing. Any last tips? I do. Yes. I've written eight. Okay. <laughs> Final last eight tips. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight tips. Everyone loves those, you know, eight tips for successful sewing. Exactly. exactly. Um, I'll just recap the videos for not yep. tying, even if they're like 30 seconds a minute, really, really helpful. Yes. Um, the sewing circle, really, yeah. really helpful, whether that's small groups or one bigger group. Um, the visuals that you use, so not only on the TV, but the giant cardboard needle and rope, so you can actually really model that to a large class. They can't see what you're doing. At no, the that's class. exactly right. <laughs> um, the trying very beginner projects using mesh and paper, thick paper plates or other sort, you could use cardboard, Yeah, um, is really good. So something rigid. For the yeah. first time so it's not moving too much I used a needle cushion so I got this old bit of foam and I sharpied little circles on it and that was how many needles I had for each wow. for the class and they had to come back so if there was one circle missing we knew there was still a needle out there <laughs> somewhere and it was the class's responsibility to try oh, and find so it good. so that really helped because otherwise needles end up everywhere yeah um, so that's a really good tip. Definitely do that again. Um, storing their work between classes. I just got those paper bags, the lunch bags. You yep. get super cheap from the supermarket. You buy in lots of hundred. Um, and we sharpied their name and grade on them. And then they just kept all their pieces in there in between class. 
And it was very easy for me to just hand their work out at the beginning of the next class um, and things didn't get lost. Masking tape, the end of the thread, really good because one pre prevents and it stops kids chopping into the middle of your, your oh, wall, wall always, trying to find an always. end. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, and also broadening that context of them understanding art worlds. So look at fashion. We did a bit of fashion illustration, one lesson, looking at the sustainability, the environmental impacts, why it's important for these life skills. So just that context of why they're learning this. Yeah, it's really, um, really, really cool. you know, it was a really, really important part of their learning. Yeah. And we also looked at how technology had changed. So I showed them some videos of like traditional Indian village weavers and thread sewing. And then we went to the more weaving machines where the guys get into the rhythm and they're weaving things and then showed them how the machines have taken over and just show them that progress that what they're actually doing, that simple in and out, is how all of our clothes, our jeans, our denim, everything gets made so that they have that understanding of the world around them. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Em, thank you very much for chatting with me today. Oh, very, very <laughs> enjoyable. I love delving into my passion and sharing it with others. Oh. If anyone's interested in connecting with me on all my socials, I'm Empower More Art on everything. I'm even on TikTok at the moment. Oh my goodness, I'm very busy. Yeah. Make sure my that's teenagers have got me on TikTok. So <laughs> I'm on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I've got a web page now. Everyone, all my videos around, I've got a playlist on sewing and weaving. So if you want to see some of those little videos about not tying and stuff we've been talking about, they're all up there. So have a I'll look. I'll make sure I put it in the notes, everything. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Em. Pleasure. Bye.